World Medicine University. 2017. Lasers and similar devices in the treatment of sebaceous hyperplasia. Introduction. Aging of the skin may be attributed to both intrinsic and extrinsic factors, with chronic exposure to ultraviolet radiation representing the greatest contributor to the latter group. As part of the pilosebaceous unit, sebaceous glands are cutaneous appendages that, likewise, undergo both intrinsic and extrinsic aging. Sebaceous hyperplasia is a benign glandular hyperproliferation that most often occurs on the face of middle-aged and elderly individuals. Although benign in its clinical behavior, sebaceous hyperplasia represents a significant cosmetic concern, especially when numerous. This chapter will present important clinical considerations as well as the current data on the pathophysiology of sebaceous hyperplasia. It will then deal with laser and light-based technologies and related procedures utilized in the treatment of these lesions. Aging of the sebaceous glands and the pathophysiology of sebaceous hyperplasia. Sebaceous glands form early in gestation as buds from the developing hair follicles. Although the number of these glands remains largely unchanged throughout life, their size changes based on the chronological age. Well developed in neonates, sebaceous glands then decrease in size and appear shrunken during infancy and childhood, only to enlarge, once again, during Adrian Archie and the subsequent puberty. Androgens appear to be the major determinant of both sebaceous gland development and sebum production, however, numerous other endocrine factors have been proposed to affect sebum production. Sebum production remains largely unchanged until the eighth decade in men, while that in women starts to gradually decrease after menopause until a nadir in the seventh decade. Sebaceous glands secrete sebum in holocrine manner, with sebocyte disintegration and subsequent release of intracellular contents. As a result, glandular cells are completely renewed every month. It has been suggested that cellular transition time the time between germinative cell division and cellular disintegration increases in the elderly resulting in slower cellular turnover and eventual glandular hyperplasia. Cellular proliferation and mitotic activity within the sebaceous glands appear, once again, to be regulated by androgens, but not by estrogens. Such hyperproliferative effect may be dependent on gland localization, with facial sebocytes affected to a much greater extent as compared to non-facial sites. Additionally, insulin, thyroid stimulating hormone, and hydrocortisone have also been found to upregulate sebocyte proliferation. Subsequent hyperplasia of undifferentiated sebaceous cells leads to the crowding and enlargement of glandular lobules, which, paradoxically, secrete very small amounts of sebum. Aside from these intrinsic factors, extrinsic factors, most notably UV radiation, have been shown to result in sebaceous gland hyperproliferation, 70. Prolonged cumulative exposure to UV light causes sebaceous hyperplasia in hairless mice. Although UVB light was utilized in this study, the deeper penetrating UV rays may have a similar effect, but need to be further researched in the future. In addition, long-term immunosuppression, especially with cyclosporin A and corticosteroids, following solid organ transplants significantly increases the incidence of sebaceous gland hyperplasia, 71. The exact mechanism of such an increase is unclear. Clinical Considerations The most common clinical presentation of sebaceous hyperplasia is that of a solitary or multiple yellowish papules, 
frequently with central umbilication around the follicular ostium and pearly appearance, thus most frequently resembling a basal cell carcinoma. 72. Dermatoscopy is a useful tool in difficult cases, allowing for the differentiation between the yellow globules and peripheral wreath-like blood vessels of a sebaceous hyperplasia and the skin color and arborizing blood vessels of a basal cell carcinoma. A biopsy should be performed if clinical doubt persists. While most lesions occur in middle-aged individuals, Premature appearance has been documented in patients as early as 12 years of age. Additionally, familial involvement with autosomal dominant inheritance has also been documented. In such cases, a diagnosis of Muir-Torre syndrome, characterized by multiple benign and malignant sebaceous neoplasms, keratoacanthoma-like lesions and internal malignancies, must be considered. With a recent finding of a significantly increased incidence of non-melanoma skin cancer in renal transplant patients with lesions of sebaceous hyperplasia as compared to those without sebaceous hyperplasia, these benign glandular hyperproliferations may actually become an important prognostic marker in this population. However, this finding needs to be confirmed in additional prospective studies. Lasers and similar technologies in the treatment of sebaceous hyperplasia. Traditional destructive modalities used in the treatment of sebaceous hyperplasia include cryosurgery, electrodesiccation, curatage, and topical bi and trichloroacetic acid. These therapies may at times, however, be associated with prolonged dyschromia and scarring. Additionally, Oral isotretinoin has been shown to be very effective in the treatment of these lesions, but is associated with multiple adverse effects, as well as rapid recurrence following the discontinuation of therapy. On the other hand, several lasers and light-based procedures have been used with success to deliver target-specific treatment with long-term improvement and few or no long-term adverse effects. Table 13 Although effective in a pilot study, the argon laser delivers nonspecific coagulation and, therefore, a higher risk of complications. More recently, a pulsed dye laser has been used in the treatment of these lesions. The tissue target for this laser appears to be the blood vessels that surround the sebaceous duct ostium. In the studies, a 585 nm laser was used with traditional, purpurogenic settings as described in Chapter 7 of this book. One to three sessions were required to clear the majority of lesions, although the risk of partial or complete recurrence following a single session was 35% in one of the studies. As mentioned in Chapters 3 and 4, mid-infrared lasers emit light whose wavelength penetrates deep into the dermis and is preferentially absorbed by water. Bulk heating of the dermal water content appears to alter sebaceous gland function and, possibly, structure. In one study, thermal coagulation of the sebaceous lobule was demonstrated in rabbit and human skin immediately following laser irradiation. By extension, a 1,450 nm diode laser has been used successfully in the treatment of sebaceous hyperplasia. In a small study of 10 patients, high fluences of up to 17J-CM2 were used in combination with prolonged cooling time to achieve excellent improvement in 70% of patients after 1 to 5 treatment sessions. Following treatment, the individual lesions may form crusts and demonstrate oily discharge for up to three days, with complete healing typically achieved by one week. Although adverse effects were rare, transient dyschromia and atrophic scarring were noted in one patient each. In our practice, we tend to utilize lower fluences in combination with stacked pulses and multiple treatment sessions. Larger studies are needed to evaluate for the optimal treatment parameters, 
the success rate, and the persistence of improvement. The most extensively studied light-based treatment modality for the treatment of sebaceous hyperplasia is photodynamic therapy. Target specificity is achieved by the preferential uptake of the photosensitizing compounds by the sebaceous glands. The complete mechanism of action of PDT is described at length in Chapter 3. Both 5-aminolavulinic acid and methylaminolavulinate have been used for this indication. Although the first report utilized an ALA incubation time of 4 hours, Subsequent studies shortened the incubation period to one hour or less without a perceptible decrease in efficacy. Likewise, various lasers and light sources have been used to activate the topical photosensitizers, including PDL, blue and red non-cohesive lights, intense pulsed light sources, and even a halogen bulb of a simple slide projector. Although not definitively proven, ALA activation using a PDL with stacked pulses may result in faster clearance, necessitating one to two sessions, as compared to the other sources of light, which typically require two to six treatment sessions administered monthly. Although the initial clearance rates are high, variably reported at 53-100% following multiple sessions, up to 20% of lesions recurred in one study within 3-4 months. Other studies documented a persistence of clearance throughout the follow-up period of up to 12 months. Thus, the need for maintenance therapy has not yet been firmly established. Adverse effects are similar to those encountered in the treatment of acne using PDT and typically include transient erythema and edema focal crusting, and, less commonly, blistering and post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, especially in individuals with darker skin tones. World Medicine Universität. 2017